From the opinion pages of the Wall Street Journal, this is Potomac Watch. Donald Trump's big victory in the South Carolina primary on Saturday brings him a giant step closer to winning his third Republican presidential nomination. He romped over Nikki Haley, the former South Carolina governor, by about 20 percentage points as uh, fewer Democrats turned out than the Haley campaign had hoped in the open primary, though not without some signs of weakness for Donald Trump with a fair number of Republican voters. Where does the Republican race stand now? And how are Biden and Trump framing their messages as they aim for the November contest? Plus, with the Michigan's primary on Tuesday, can the Democratic anti-Israel left send a message to President Biden? Welcome. I'm Paul Gigo with the editorial page of the Wall Street Journal here on our daily podcast, Potomac Watch. And I'm here with my esteemed colleagues, Kim Strassel and Bill McGurn. Now, welcome to you both. Big victory for Trump, no question about it, Kim. Haley just couldn't break through enough to really send a shock to the Trumpians. The Democrats didn't show up. Only 5% of the voters, according to the exit poll, were Democrats. She needed a lot more than that. Because Trump won among nearly all Republican voter groups, one exception being those who identified themselves as moderates. But what do you make of the overall strength of Trump? Any weaknesses you detect? Well, a couple, Paul. But I mean, let's talk first about his strengths. If you look at the exit polls in South Carolina, they looked a lot more like the Iowa exit polls than they did the New Hampshire exit polls. That was obviously not good for Nikki Haley, those who identified as very conservative, 80 percent of them voted for Donald Trump. You saw the similar breakouts. Those who were college educated voted about 50 percent for each of the candidates. Those who lacked a college degree, about 75 percent for Trump. One other interesting thing, especially given all of the debate we've had lately about cultural issues, Trump shored up his share of white evangelicals compared to his showings in past primaries in 2016. He won almost three quarters of those. There are some issues, though, for him. There was a result very much matching what you saw out of Iowa, which is 36 percent of those voted said that they felt he would be unfit to be the president if he were convicted of a crime. That is not a small number. And if you look at those who voted for Haley, and this is both a comment on her, but also a comment on him, about Four out of 10 of those who voted for Haley said that they were doing it as a vote in opposition to Trump, not necessarily because they hugely adored her, but because they do not want him to win the nomination. And I think those are a bit of warning signs for him just about his ability to shore up the Republican base when it comes time. Yeah, no question, Trump has really consolidated votes among conservatives. I mean, he just had a runaway support bill. He also dominated what were the voters' two big issues, the economy and uh, even more important, immigration and the border. He just dominated that. And then that signature issue of the border for him has really helped him here because under Joe Biden, it's become so prominent in the minds of voters. And he has benefited from that. So no matter what Haley said, that she'd be tough too. She just can't outflank him on that one. But to elaborate on a point that Kim made about a weakness of Trump, Haley won Charleston counties and Richmond counties. This is a city of Charleston and Columbia. Those are suburban areas, relatively well off, where Trump has been weakest in previous races, not just in South Carolina, but around the country. Charleston and Columbia represent the country more broadly, I think, than the rest of South Carolina does, which is much more conservative than the rest of the country. That is something that some Democrats are pointing to as a sign that Trump is going to have a challenge with Biden. Yeah, I think this race is fascinating because it's so different from 2016. In 2016, Donald Trump was a rich guy from Manhattan, desperate to prove He wasn't just running on a pirate flag convenience, that he actually stood for Republican principles. And many of his statements before he ran for president on defense, on guns, on abortion, were not the views of the Republican Party. You know, they were the views of a wealthy uh, New Yorker. So he had to prove his conservative credentials. And he famously came out with that list of Supreme Court nominees, uh, all originalists, good people. And that helped him a lot. This time around, the interesting thing is Mr. Trump's favorite epithet 
to hurl at uh, someone now it's Nikki Haley because she's the last one standing is Rhino accusing her of not really being Republican. And I find it fascinating because even if you don't like Nikki Haley, even if you think she's not the best representative, I think it would be hard to look through what she's advocating and find some deviation from classic republicanism. You know, strong defense, free economy, and so forth. Some don't trust her on abortion because she said a national law would have no chance, but she describes herself as pro-life. She's a rhino, and she's not the only one. A lot of other people, DeSantis has been called a rhino. Yet it's Donald Trump who now, like, I think if you look at the successes of his administration, they were classic Republicans, low taxes, light regulation, a strong defense, and so forth, and little advancement of the pro-life cause and looking out for the Second Amendment. All his victories and the victories that really delivered results for the American people were when he cooperated with Republicans on the Hill and pushed a standard Republican agenda. Now he's like, no trade deals, can't touch entitlements, you know, which is at the root of our out of control spending. And NATO is a bad thing because the Europeans are freeloaders, you know, no strategic discussion. And on policy, he seems to be emphasizing the parts of his agenda that weren't really a factor, that didn't really deliver for him. And yet, He says he's not the rhino. Haley is a rhino. I think rhino has come to mean not as it originally meant someone who was moderate or deviated from the conservative agenda. Now it means just Donald Trump doesn't like you. And he's kind of Louis the 14th who said, I am France. I am the Republican Party. So if you disagree, you're a rhino. Well, one of the things that uh, I think the press corps ought to retire is the line that somehow Trump is an insurgent taking on the Republican establishment. Trump is the establishment, full stop right now. I mean, when you can replace the head of the Republican National Committee as he is just by saying, I think it's time for her to go and even float the name of your daughter-in-law as a potential replacement. That's the establishment. When you can dictate to the House of Representatives that you shouldn't vote for Ukraine aid and they don't even take up a vote, that's the sign of who the new establishment is. And uh, of course, the members of Congress and policy makers, state officials all across the country have fallen in line. So let's drop that trope. Kim, I guess the big question for Trump is, How many of those Haley voters would not support Trump in November will stick to that? How many will come back into the fold if it's a binary choice between Trump and Biden? Because you don't need much more than 10 percent of the Republican Party to stay home or vote for a third party or vote for Biden to make this a very, very competitive race. Yeah. And in that regard, Biden might be Trump's best instrument at the moment, as it were. I mean, I think back, Paul, and I was there wandering around the convention in 2016 when there was still a sizable proportion of activists in the Republican Party that were determined to deny Donald Trump the nomination and were uh, maneuvering behind the scenes to try to do different rule changes and stop that. And yet, by the time the election came around in 2016, he had very much consolidated the Republican base. Now, People have their experience with him. They have some not great memories of him, especially on January 6th and the end of his term. Does that change things this time around? Or is Biden simply such a bad alternative that they will decide to rally around the leader in the end? By the way, and I want to throw this in about Haley and her campaigning, is if she's going to make a change, there were clear evidence in these exit polls that she ought to. She has been spending her entire time talking about how Donald Trump can't win against Biden. And I was fascinated to see that in the exit polls, six in 10 voters in the primary said that Trump was very likely to beat Joe Biden versus only 25 percent who believed Haley was likely to beat Biden, which is just entirely opposite than everything you see in theoretical polling out there, where Haley is a far more bigger threat to Joe Biden than Trump ever is. Also, amazingly, only 60 percent of voters felt Haley had the mental and physical fitness to be president, and nearly 40 percent said no. 
and these numbers were less than Trump is pretty stunning stuff. Well, she's 52. He's 77. You make your own call about who's more physically fit, at least. The interesting thing about that is I think that that signals that you know, the voters in South Carolina just believe that Trump won once to be president and he could do it again. And uh, Biden is so weak, they think he can beat him. So you can, I think, credit Biden's weakness for people believing that. 